Welcome, everybody. I'm going to read a really brief statement from Critical Mass, and then I'm going to hand it over to our panel up here. So Critical Conversations is a program by Critical Mass for the Visual Arts that strives to sustain important dialogues on art in St. Louis. When we began organizing this event, which is the sixth in an ongoing series, way back in June, we made this a partnership with the Contemporary Art Museum. Our committee planned then to form a panel discussion on art in the black body in a much broader context than just Kelly Walker's artwork. We did not intend and do not intend now to answer for Kelly Walker or Cam for hosting the exhibit. Throughout the past several days, we at Critical Mass have been listening to our community, and we see that some people wish to speak directly to their experience of the artist's talk here last Saturday, and to talk about the long history between our local black community and St. Louis cultural institutions. To that end, we are going to follow this critical conversation with at least one future event. We'll hold that planned broader conversation about art in the black body at a later date and in a different location. Tonight, we want to provide an opportunity to center black critical voices around what people feel, think, and want right here, right now. We acknowledge that many people are making their voices heard by not being here tonight. We respect and appreciate that action and do not wish for this event to diminish those community members' voices. With that, I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Rebecca Wanzo, Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Director of the Center for the Humanities at Washington University. Good evening. Um, can everyone hear me? Uh, first, I feel moved and want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge and remember um, what I think is on the minds, I suspect, of a number of panelists and other people in the room. Um, the struggles right now in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and Keith Lamont Scott, Tulsa, and Terrence Crutcher, and my former hometown, Columbus, um, and the death of Tyree King. It's been a hard week. Um, obviously, it's been hard years. Um, and I think if the advent of the circulation of black death on social media has taught us anything, it's taught us about its power to force attention and action and the pain and the importance of bearing witness. Um, but it's also taught us that no matter how incontrovertible the visual record may seem to some of us, it is never evidence to others. So on one hand, it's very clear that visibility won't save us. But on the other hand, many, many people have made a commitment to reframing violence against black bodies for others. And that is what some vitally important political art can do. It can make people see and think about what they see with a new lens. So on that note, um, I'd like to say um, how happy I am to see this many people here um, who are interested in centering black voices in this space. Um, I recognize that some people have felt that that's not for them, and that's completely understandable. But in taking part in some conversations over the last few days, and in deciding how to be responsive to um, the actual conversation that's been taking place, it seemed that many people thought it was important for local African Americans in the arts community to be heard. Um, and in, this is a community, I think, where we are really privileged uh, to have a thriving black arts culture and people who recognize that representation is, in many ways, um, at the heart of our struggle. And so there are ways in which some people might see the exhibit that has been very controversial um, as extraordinarily successful at speaking truths about how black people are seen as objects. Um, thus the exhibit and then the ensuing gallery talk place at the center questions about the relationship between the artist and his and her subjects, between art and cultural institutions and local communities. And our tremendous panel is going to um, completely help us work through this. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce everyone at once. And then each of them are gonna speak for about five minutes. And then we'll have comments and questions from the audience and hopefully we'll get a good conversation going. I should say that in my capacity as moderator, um, it's my job to make sure that a lot of people are heard. Um, so I hope that people respect that lots of folks deserve to have a chance to speak and that it's important to keep the conversation moving um, and also um, make sure that people are heard um, and embrace listening 
um, to what many people have to say. Um, so I'll start off with M.K. Stallings, um, who's a poet, a columnist, and founder of Herb Arts, a 5013C3 nonprofit organization that promotes art, education, and social services in the state of Missouri. Lyndon Barria is an artist, museum educator, and visual arts professor. His recent exhibitions include For the Benefit of Man at the Garwood Gallery, Float at Fort Gondo Compound for the Arts, and Of Color for the Great Rivers Biennial. Then we have Vanity G, Director of Community Programs and Grand Center Operations at Craft Alliance Center of Art and Design, as well as an educator and musician. Khalil Irving, an artist and MFA candidate and Chancellor's Graduate Fellow at Washington University. His recent shows include Functionality at the Edwardsville Art Center, Yet Unfulfilled at the Reese Gallery, and Designated Areas at the Del Mar Loop Gallery. Then Kat Reynolds, an artist who specializes in portraiture and architectural <coughs> photography. Her recent shows include Soften at Museum Blue, Ask Her How She's Doing at Fort Gondo, and The Divide at Blank Space. And then finally, we have Danielle, Danielle and Kevin McCoy. They make up Work Play, an interdisciplinary design duo. Their recent shows include Printmaking in St. Louis at the Sheldon Galleries, Artwork at Westminster Press, and Empowerment at the Luminary. So, MK. Good evening. Well, uh, I am, I'm honored to uh, be able to, to offer some thoughts that might reflect the views of some of you in the audience as it relates to how black people might be represented in art, and in particular, partic and in particular struggles that we might find ourselves uh, in. You know, when I was thinking about some of the work that particularly black Star Press, and I wondered if this were, let's say, uh, a photograph, an image of a, I don't know, we could pick anybody, uh, former President George W. Bush uh, on an aircraft carrier announcing, you know, his excitement about, you know, winning this war, right, that didn't end. I wonder if we saw those, that same overlay of, of chocolate and, and whatever smears, see swirls, if I would feel, because I'm not a fan of George W. Bush, if I would feel happy about it, if I'd feel somehow like that speaks to my view of him and his accomplishments or non-accomplishments, how would it move me? Would it move me in a way that some people may have been moved by seeing an image of the black, of the black freedom struggle in the United States in those same kind of, that same kind of overlay? Would, would I be moved in a similar way for some? And, and I think that unfortunately when it comes to art, it, especially art that is of course subjective, it gives space for people who are bigots to celebrate and revel in, in, in images that seem to demean the value of the struggle faced by some in the United States. And I think in a space like that, it's really important to have individuals who are able to at least defend their art. And if they're not able to defend it, and if you can't articulate why you created it, then it creates a space a vacuum where all these questions will be asked, accusations will be thrown or bandied about, and we really won't be able to move forward. So I would hope that in a critical space, whenever we see art, it encourages conversation. And not just any conversation, but also places things into a historical framework. Because again, when I think about the Black Star Press, I think about the struggle of someone like Marcus Garvey, and the Black Star Line, and what that was an answer to and an answer for. Now think about the role of even the black press in the United States and how it had to advocate and put news stories out there that weren't covered. 
And then I think about the images of these individuals who are on the front lines of those struggles within the context of protest and riot now, you better have an answer for it because the critics will have the questions. Good evening. <clears throat> thank you, MK. Um, I want to thank everyone else who's here with me on the panel for joining me. Um, most of them, actually all of them, are my friends. Um, I didn't ask all of them to be here myself. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised that they agreed to be here. Um, I think for me, I mean, I'm here as an artist who asks myself a lot of the questions that MK just brought up. And as an artist who also makes a practice of appropriating imagery, um, what, when, when, it, when, is it, when it is it okay to doing, to, you know, or to take the image that I'm taking, how is my, what is, what is the treatment of the image doing? And, you know, what the content of that image is. And I think that's what, um, you know, the, 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 I say the summer months leading up to tonight have been about um, in regards to what's happened in this building. Um, but then also thinking about, I mean, the topic at hand, which will, I'm sure, um, come up quite a bit, which is race and, you know, thinking about my own identity and, and how these decisions um, reflect on that experience. And then being in St. Louis, where was I going with that? <laughs> That'll come back to me. In St. Louis, um, being an artist in St. Louis and thinking about the spaces to exhibit in St. Louis and thinking about what happens in those spaces, um, you know, over the years I've <clears throat> started to, you know, as I've sort of begun to step outside of my visual practice and thinking about, um, you know, what it means to voice opinions through writing and, and you know, what maybe is necessary or possible in regards to organizing the work of other artists that I know or other artists whose work that I, I feel should be, um, you know, shown or exhibited or, or talked about in a certain way. I think that I've, I've acknowledged sort of this, this lack of um, activity or representation, not just for black contemporary art in the city, but um, one that, uh, you know, exhibitions or, or, or instances in which um, these works or exhibitions are able to be quite nuanced and expansive and diverse in, in, the su in subject matter, diverse in form, um, which I think points to a much larger issue when it comes to, I think, art that's exhibited in, in many other cities. And I think bigger cities don't really have this problem because they have the population and they have the, the buildings and spaces to support these things. But um, in a city like this, there's, you know, there's quite a distance to go, right? So I think that a lot of the concerns maybe, you know, of what we've been seeing this, this week is also an effect <clears throat> and a consequence of that lack of representation, you know, that lack of nuance in representation, um, which, which is something that I often think about and something that I'm, I'm hopefully working to resolve. Um, I, I guess I should also state that I am an employee of this museum, um, but I by no means am here to defend what has taken place in this museum. And, um, yeah, I'm here. I'm here as an artist who can be critical in this space as an employee. Thank you. 
So um, I was really at peace when I came here uh, to serve on this panel with my friends and colleagues and loved ones. That's what I consider all these folks up here. Because I cannot let one person and one person's ignorance shatter my sense of self and being. With that said, I am angry, I am frustrated, um, and I've been thinking about words that Mark Bradford said here months ago, May 5th. I had written it in my notebook, so I pulled it out. Uh, this is not an exact quote, but he said, the black body is so political and so politicized that it walks into the room before you, then your gender, then height, and then whoever you are. And so when I think about all of the outrage at this, it's clearly to me because of what black bodies have meant in this country over centuries, what they've meant around the world for centuries. And so to show this work and think that race is not really an issue and that process and talent is enough to cover up something that is so politicized and so political, to me is um, almost an intentional sidestepping. It's that art speak will overcome these other issues, uh, the disagreement. It's, it, will, it will somehow um, make smaller the controversy that is represented in this work. Clearly, it did not happen that way. Um, and so I was actually not at the talk on Saturday. Um, I first saw my friend Damon's post on Facebook, and I was just like, what the heck happened? This is crazy. Because I had been at CAM many times before, seen many shows that were by excellent black artists. So clearly, to me, this was an institution that supported the work of contemporary black artists. That, that was no question in my mind. But something had fallen through the cracks. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of wanted to know why. So I came and looked at the show, because I was actually avoiding it just because of my own apprehensions about the work far before the show on, before the talk on Saturday. And it's interesting, when I looked at it, I wasn't immediately taken aback. Now, I was like, ugh. But I, I, tried to, I tried to position myself in a place of like, what could this artist have been thinking, right? I'm trying to be a little bit objective here and not come in with an immediate bias because that is how I operate in my life. Not everyone else has to do that, that's fine. This is how I operate. So I tried to look at the art and just say, okay, could I bring my daughter here? Would I feel comfortable bringing my middle school students here? How would I justify this work being so large and so present in this very popular institution that services children all of the time? Services adults, services brown people, um, is in a 50% brown community. And as I kept walking through it, I looked at it in the context of everything else in the exhibition. And I got more upset because then I felt like I'm looking at this work of these people who put their lives on the line and some of them very well lost their lives, their livelihood, their families, their homes with chocolate and toothpaste smeared digitally or not, smeared on their bodies next to some vinyl records done in a similar process. And I got really angry um, because it was about process and imagery and not about the bodies represented in, that, in those images. At least that's what came across to me. Um, I did have a chance to listen to it, to the talk, watch part of it, and I still felt that way afterwards. It came even more apparent to me. So I think what I hope to talk about throughout the rest of this evening, at least from my perspective, is representation in institutions at large, representation in positions of power, 
whose voices are making final decisions, um, people who are quote unquote not high up on the food chain uh, being considered just as valid. Um, I took this amazing course called uh, Social Change and Leadership Organizations and it's really about when you are in any type of organization, leadership comes at all levels, not just the people who get paid the most. And to me that means that from custodians to wait staff to managers, everyone voices matter and they matter equally and they should because everyone's contributions keep this, this machine running. And so I hope to talk about some of that and I'm gonna stop now. There's a lot of people here. <laughs> Don't be afraid to come in the center. We all gonna have to be family here tonight. I left St. Louis about six years ago, going on six years ago, to leave, to start my life as a man, as a black man, as an artist, start a journey that I could never see my life without. I went to Kansas City, went to the Kansas City Art Institute to get my bachelor's degree. And the way the world was shifted for me was so much different from what I was experiencing and growing up with here in St. Louis. I became a man. I studied abroad in nine countries. And it came upon my fifth year of school and I had to think about what I was gonna do after. I applied to six schools. I applied to Yale, Columbia University, UCLA, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and lastly, Washington University in St. Louis. I never knew that the shift in my life would actually like, bring me back to the place in which I like, grew up. I was running away. I wanted to get so far away. I wanted to go away because I thought the things that tormented me the most would leave me alone and never come back to haunt me again. But when I landed in Hungary for my first semester of studying abroad in 2013, I was addressed as a nigger. My hair was pulled, I was spit on, and I was treated like shit walking down the street in a country that I thought was amazing. But I had to persevere and continue to make my work. I had to persevere to keep doing what I had to do. One of my favorite artists of the whole wide world, his name is Kerry James Marshall. And I met him April 23rd, 2015. And my life was shattered. Everything I knew about art was changed. For someone to, like, to say that Kelly Walker's the one artist that's working through history, race, identity, and evolving, rotating implications, pisses me off. I'm sorry, but Kelly Walker is not the only one. You got Kerry James Marshall, you have William Pobell, you have Carol Walker, you have Glenn Ligon, you have a slew of names that can be rung through this building. Theaster Gates himself could walk in here and everybody's mind would be blown and no one would be able to pick themselves up because they would be so excited that they were in his presence. But his work has validation. These people are my family and my friends. And that's what keeps going, that's what keeps me going in my studio. I think about myself and I, I left to go away and I made these objects that were so abstract that didn't have any representation of anything of the world, but I used the world to make those objects. And I burned those things away, making fossils. But in fact, when I come back to the United States from studying abroad for a year, I started to make the litter that litters the streets that we walk on every day and then I cover those blanket porcelain objects with the, the same colors and patterns and forms that that they are themselves and what might be inside them. One of my favorite, one of my friends told me the other day, you know, art speak only goes so far. 
And I told this lady who's writing this article, I said, life is art and art is life. If you in become so inseparable from those two things and you're so confused that poverty porn is sexy to you and you want to bring that in your space, when you, when, when you validate things just because someone of the same racial background says something that still is inappropriate and you, you accept it, that's still wrong. I'm still gonna go home and I'm gonna make my work. I'm still gonna be a rock star. I'm gonna keep doing what I gotta do for me and mine and my family and the people I love the most. And nothing's gonna stand in my way. I'm not, I'm not ashamed Kelly Walker didn't ask my question. I asked Kelly Walker if his work is about documenting technological advancement, talking about PCs and Macs and printers and 3D, this and that, then why are you so focused on the black body? Why are you worried about Little Richard? Leave Little Richard alone. What did he do to you? <laughs> I mean, Michael Jackson had a real tormented life. You're going to go make a work called White Michael Jackson? That's pretty fucked up. I mean, I'm not even being funny. I'm being quite serious because Michael Jackson to me is a star. He's a, he's a mentor. He's a, he, he is a rock. Not only of black people, but it's a, he, you can't talk about pop music without talking about the king. And to make a joke and a fool of him in that image, white on white, that's it's mockery. It's 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 like more than a mockery because it's 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 even more than disrespect because you're like dehumanizing a human being in an image, and then that image then has to live on its own out in the world, hanging on a wall, on a white wall, on at that. I'm just gonna say, everybody, you're gonna have to look in your hearts, and you're gonna have to see the reality of the world that we live in. And if you don't, you're gonna be passed by because we're evolving at an ever fast rate. Man, I, get, I tell you, good luck. Hi, everyone. Hey, <laughs> I'm Kat. Um, I just wanna say thank you to every single person that came out tonight um, to support us as well as to know that this is a mess and to know that I'm uncomfortable. I tried to write something down. I even like thought about writing things down like I can't write this down like how uncomfortable I feel. The, the way that I felt at the artist talk sitting next to Khalil and feeding off of his energy and him asking me is it gonna be me or you? to ask these questions tonight, or today. And I told him, I was like, I did. I did the last one. The last one that was fucked up. The last one at Projects Plus Gallery that was fucked up for me, and a lot of other people. That was an issue. And why that's an issue is because it, the accountability that is what we are talking about today, is the lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. And the lack of awareness. You have to be aware of me and my blackness. It is not going away. It is here. It is right here, right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then, <laughs> when you, the fake awareness of trying to tell me that, you know that these are black magazines, right? Trying to educate me on something that I already fucking know. And for one, those women have management. They get paid for these things. Putting toothpaste that looks like semen and then allowing people to walk on her body as a black woman, that is not okay. As a woman, that is not okay. You cannot allow people to walk on her body. The fact that this was ranked as being okay for curation is more than problematic, more than an issue. It is disheartening. It is very disheartening. I felt uncared for as a black artist in this city 
That is not the message that I would ever want to put out there for anyone. What I want, once again, with what Vanny was saying, what I want my daughter, if I had a kid, what I want her to come in here and be like, hey, look at you on this, this wall and on the floor. Don't you feel adored? Don't you feel appreciated? No, you don't feel any of that. And that's the issue, is a lack of awareness and appreciation for black bodies. Um, that's all, that's all that I really have to say. And as a photographer, I know, I try to know how my subject is feeling. Vaughn, you know how, you, you know, I like to know how you're feeling. I like to know how my subject is feeling, how important that is. How I am feeling, I am sad, I am hurt, but I'm also not here to tell you about my black sadness, and about my black hurt right now. It's about you being aware that this is an issue and why this is an issue and for the lack of accountability. Um, hello, everyone. Um, beyond nervous, uh, I'm going to be real with you. I really didn't want to talk. Um, you know, my, my queen gave me something to think about the other day. She said to, uh, sometimes you have to talk even if your voice trembles. And I, can, I think I can speak for most black folks in the room when we say we, we're just fucking tired of talking about this shit. And, and to dovetail on what Kat is speaking of, about having children come in here and view the works, I have a daughter on the way right now. She's up here with us, right? And I, I have to talk to her every night. You know, the bond starts with us right now, not when she's out of the wound, it's now. She knows daddy's voice. And I have to affirm to her what she is, where she comes from. Never to bow, never to bend, never to break and be proud in your culture, always because the world is gonna tell you otherwise. And they're gonna tell you that when you go into space. They're gonna tell you that your jobs, opportunities. And so for me, I wanna discuss accountability. You know, accountability is a very prominent issue here. I mean, it's just like the cops. And I'm not saying that all cops are bad, but there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever they want with our bodies. And that's been the history in America. We can use them as slaves. There was a law, fuck laws. The law was, I can take that black body, I can punish him if he leaves because he doesn't want to be a slave. There were laws for that, to justify that behavior. So this is a very real issue. And we live in a world where propaganda, kids are indoctrinated at a very early fucking age. We did a, for the PowerPoint, PowerPoint, was that, I got it right? And PowerPoint, I'm sorry. Um, that was deep for us. That was really, that was painful. We were seeing cartoons from the 40s and the 50s. Do you know, I'm going to tell y'all, I'm going to give y'all some fucking research, some homework, okay, as adults. Go look up the Lazy Town, where it's black folks depicted with the big exaggerated red lips, right? Everyone's sleeping, right? There's the mammy, oh, child, I'm sure is tired. These kids are indoctrinated at a very early age to know that color exists. So we can't pretend like it doesn't. It does. And then you're seeing these bodies plastered and they're over-sexualized. We're demonized as black people. We've always been that, people of color in general. So where is the accountability? Our bodies have always been at the helm of someone else's hands, never to be held accountable. Good evening. Um, it's hard to go last because you just want to say, uh, yeah, what they said. <laughs> um, so what I just want to say br just briefly uh, is just two sides of the coin. First, um, I do commend these local institutions on collaborating and working with the art community. Uh, we've traveled many different places and you walk into these galleries, you walk into these museums, and the people that you read about, you hear about, are all from around the world. 
and I'm not saying that Kelly Walker is from St. Louis, but I've seen firsthand my friends doing photography for the museums, us designing the open studio map, um, working with the Luminary, working with Fort Gondo, working with the Sheldon, and I appreciate that because as an artist, you understand how hard it is to get into any of these institutions and for people to see your work. From the moment that you say you wanna become an artist, in the back of your mind, you may be like, am I gonna be a starving artist? Or am I gonna actually like do this shit? And it feels great to be appreciated, to be known, to be, I'm not saying recognized or anything, like people have to call you out and ask for a signature, that's not what I'm getting at, but just to be like, you know, I know this person's work or their body of work and, and what that means. So to, even though my husband and I, just like Vanity said, we weren't here on Saturday, we did see the video and just to know that as an artist, you cannot articulate your work or why you created it is a little bit questionable. Um, and I, look, I just wrote down a few notes here. I mean, as Kevin said, yes, we have, a daughter that'll be here within like three weeks. And it's just thinking like, what, what do you explain to a child as they come through and they see this, this imagery of the King magazine, right? And as they said, like, it does look like jizz. So if you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. And then um, when I think about the um, civil rights thing, you know, I, I try to talk to my my elders and my family. And when I talk to them, I just like shut the hell up because I just want them to speak and tell me about their upbringing in the South, growing up in Mississippi, growing up in Memphis. And it breaks my heart because none of them want to talk about it. I'm constantly talking to my husband about uh, different things that we're going through. And he's right, you do get tired of talking about the social climate uh, the racial climate, I'm sorry, that's going on <clears throat> in this country and how you feel like your body is not one that's appreciated. Yes, thank you, Kevin, valued. Um, my side, yeah, my, okay. Um, <laughs> you had your turn. Um, <laughs> so, as I sit and I talk to my 92-year-old grandfather, and as I spoke to my 97-year-old great-grandmother, two different sides of the family, obviously she didn't have him at five. <laughs> they just shake their head and they're just like, you know, it wasn't good. Is that what I'm gonna tell my great-grandchild? What happened in the 2000s? I heard about this Mike Brown. I heard that it, it happened not far from where you lived and I'm just gonna shake my head and say, it wasn't good. Or am I gonna open up and explain to them that we were there we were supporting our friends and their artistic endeavors to expose this. Am I gonna tell them that we lived two blocks away when Von Derrick was shot and killed? Am I gonna tell them that I've never had a chance to mourn over this before someone else dies? Who, again, accountability. I mean, I, your mind is so much, I mean, there's so much just trauma, it feels like, that we go through mentally that you can't even fully heal. I mean, imagine if it was your family member and it's like one minute your mom dies and you're just like, damn. And then it's like, dad died too? Wait, now uncle and aunt died? It's, it's a lot. And for those that don't get it, you need to get it. Because it is so hard on us. And then we have to turn around, go to work, keep a smile on our face, make this art shit, and act like nothing happened. We are, we are torn up on the inside. So then you come into an institution, you know, and we see these, these images, and it is almost like a mockery in a way, but to the coin, I, I guess in a way I'm somewhat happy that we have challenged this. This is, our, this is the art community coming together. These are our supporters coming together. You can't just always see something and be okay with it. I've been to exhibitions and tried to hold people accountable and I've written a letter and what did I get back? Just 
a BS response and you're like, no, let's keep talking about this. And there's no way to like fully um, explain certain things. So um, I'll continue to support, but we'll see what happens after all this. I'm glad there's conversation. I'm glad that we're critiquing it. I'm glad the exposure is out. Um, I too received about two or three phone calls after Saturday about like, let me tell you what just happened. So I already knew <laughs> just from hearing an artist talk um, before with Kelly Walker. So that's all I really have to say. I hope that um, we can all come to a solid resolution of all this and there's a positive takeaway at the end. Um, so thank you. Okay, so we have time now to open it up, and I'm not sure if there's a microphone, yes, that is going to go around. Um, so if you raise your hand, a mic will come to you. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, how did we get here? What happens when an artist does work like this and this decision is made in order for it to get exhibited and with there apparently not being much thought as to how this is going to be received and how it's going to be even reflected on the institution, this situation kind of reminds me of when you see a commercial that's really, really bad and racially offensive, you think, well, who is in the room? How did this get so far? So that's, that's my question. Obviously a question for me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's very complicated. So I think, so one thing that I, I can speak to as, you know, as working here and being behind the scenes leading up to this point is that I think, um, I, in seeing the work, initially, and even in, in being skeptical of it, I was encouraged to, because I'm also looking at the work's track record, right? So the work, this isn't the first time it's been shown. It's 10 years old, if, if not more. Um, it's collected, it's sort of critically endorsed, it's fiscally endorsed, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's been around. And so, for me, I'm, and that's not to like condone it, I'm saying that for me, it caused me, because I'm, I don't, I don't just look at surface things, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really analyze these things, right? So, I'm, I'm, tr I'm, part of it is, is me asking questions as to why that is as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's kind of been, my process all summer when I first learned about this being next up in line, exhibition-wise. Um, and some of those, you know, some of those questions were, were voiced and, and, and talked out. Like, you know, I've had conversations about it, but at, at no point, you know, and, and, and I never said, okay, I get it. There was always like this sort of, you know, continued kind of skepticism and questioning. But I never at any point thought that we wouldn't show it, um, mostly because it had been shown. I would, I would assume that it would be shown again. And my question wasn't, you know, my questions were around how it would be not only received, but how, how do we talk about it once it's up? Like for me, in my, in my position here, it, it's sort of my job to be able to articulate the work that's on view. And for me, it was a matter of like, how do I, how do I use this as an opportunity to actually ask certain questions of the work? And so, so my impulse isn't this shouldn't be shown because I mean, that's just not how I think of things. My impulse is if it's going to be shown, how, how do we, 
Like, how do we validate that showing? How do we, how do we, how do we decide that that showing is constructive? You know, how do we, uh, how do we decide or, or, or talk out whether or not um, the work is problematic? How do we, you know, what position do we have in allowing the work to appreciate in the world? And which was part of, you know, the sort of purpose of this panel initially, you know, before Saturday. Um, <laughs> And up until the opening, I still had these questions. I was still skeptical, I'm still skeptical. Um, and, and I think it's been sort of widely accepted that if there is any inkling of a sort of constructive narrative on race and culture and sexuality, um, that was completely undermined by what happened on Saturday. And, and that doesn't necessarily matter anymore. So, I mean, now we're, we're sort of at a time where it's even more, but you know, before it, we were in a situation where we're gonna, you know, kind of think about this critically and ask all of these sort of theoretical questions and, and you know, think maybe ideally or, or maybe even sort of, um, you know, speak responsibly about certain things. But I feel like now the urgency is so much more pressing and, and now we're really at a unique opportunity to, to really think about, um, not just what it means to like consider what's what's shown in the public realm, but to also like um, to like to consider the specificity of the context in which it's shown, right? Like, and again, I think that goes back for me, like about a lack of a lack of of again nuance and complexity of representation, and that we can't. And that, that, you know, that, that sort of shows the, the distance, I would say, maybe, of, of the institution and perhaps the artist. And, you know, it was, you know, he exposed in the talk that, you know, he had no answer for who his audience was, um, which is another problem, right? And, and so now my feeling is that, or my fear is that this is just a blip in the trajectory, tra trajectory of this work and that nothing changes. But my hope is that the question will stop being why do people have a problem with this? But my hope is that the people who haven't had a problem can reconsider why that's the case. And, and hopefully that changes the value, um, the, the acclaim, <laughs> um, on a broader scale, you know, to ask like bigger questions about who gets to make certain work, who gets off the hook in explaining that work and articulating that work, who gets protected, um, and the difference between those who get protected and like who, like, you know, who's expected to actually speak for themselves. Because I keep coming back to the fact that I don't think I could make that work and not talk about it. And, but I, and I also go to, the fact that I think regardless of the race of that artist, I think some of that, you know, even if that artist, even if that work is made by, you know, an African-American person, I mean, there's still questions to be answered. Like, I think there's still things in there that, you know, are still quite unclear. And um, so, I don't know, I mean, we're a ways away from your question, but <laughs> um, I mean, the short answer is, this is a museum and, you know, shit gets shown in museums all the time and it's not always like, I, I mean, it's, it's not always maybe things that should be. And I think it really is, I mean, if anything, like it's so important that the public shows up, right? And um, important that they show up and that their voices are heard like they're being right now um, so that we really have a chance to continually check in and, and reevaluate the value of things and reevaluate the standard of things. I just wanted to jump in and say something really quick about museum processes. I, I used to work for a museum, and uh, these museums have like exhibit teams, some of them. And at the exhibit team, you look at all the, the artifacts, all the objects that are uh, being considered for exhibition, and sometimes you make decisions based on the controversy that an object my court. And so the question then becomes, what do you really want to have happen from 
displaying an object? Do you want like a gallery full of people because of the controversy, kind of like clickbait? And if you surf the internet and you click on something because it seems so crazy, like, oh, I got to see what that is. And then, you know, you start counting the number of clicks because you use that to, you know, fund further activities in these kinds of spaces. Uh, so if that's the purpose, then that means that black pain, black struggle is at the expense of some kind of in real life clickbait. So as a, as, a, as a museum or as a staff, you have to make a decision about what you want to be held accountable for, right? right? And, uh, and there's, in, his, in his body of work, there are so many pieces that can be shown. And, and as noted, the work was uh, made back in what, 2005, 2006. It's been shown several places. This, this museum's website featured, featured that. Uh, painting prominently of uh, that piece prominently uh, describing what it does and and how it affects people so was it a it was a very important piece that needed to be showcased in this show so there's no surprise as to why it was shown here we are at the expense of what so there's a guy by the name of Haki Madabuti he's a poet comes out of the the, the, the black arts movement of the 1960s. He talks about black art, in his view, being a functional, useful art. Like you create it, and then the audience receives it, and then they have to figure out what they can, how they can use it in their lives. So with that work, how can we use that in our lives? How, I mean, how does that move us? What does that open up for us? It doesn't open up much conversation if the artist is not able to speak. Maybe he thinks that it speaks for itself, but so does cross burnings. Hello. So the question becomes, what is the role of the, the institution for presenting the work? And I'm not saying censor artists, and certainly having a conversation attached to showing the work is important, but we can't forget about clickbait Uh, recently, I just returned from a residency for six weeks in Venice, Italy. I don't know if anybody's been there in this room, and if you have, you go in San Marco Square, one of the old ca oldest cafes in the world lives there. And in one of these cafes there, there's a chandelier with pure, clear crystal with black women's heads cut off and hanging from that chandelier. And then the, every three feet on the wall, there's sconces with a big redded lip black head figurehead there. My friend said, oh, don't take that down, man. That doesn't need to come down. I said, are we in 1498? I don't walk around with shackles on my neck. So I don't know if you're confused or not, but that is an image of my mom, my sister, my grandmother my cousins, and my friends. If that doesn't come down, or if you don't allow it to exist in the first place, it ain't censorship. If you don't put it up, it ain't censorship. You just chose to stand and look the other direction. I mean, it doesn't matter what it takes. But how this gets here is a, is a, is a series of it's not just even accountability, it's a, it's, a, it's a series of yeses. And someone in that line just kept saying yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes! I want it, it's like they won the jackpot. They knew something that was gonna get them their return. That's why this is here. Somebody wanted a return. But they're not gonna get it this time because it's got to go. The one thing that I want to dovetail what Khalil is saying is, you know, he talked about seeing those sconces and that chandelier. And let me give you a very visceral thing to think about is when they were hanging black men and women and you had whites in suits, ties, fresh out of church. And the one thing that always struck me was no one grimaced. They were just looking like this was the norm. It was like looking at a fucking cat or dog walk by. 
And to them, they probably was. We were animals. And these are free men, right? And they just sitting there watching. Sunday's best. And then I learned about Dr. Joy DeGroy. And if you haven't heard of her, you should look her up. And they talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome. And this is real. How the shit that we deal with today is directly connected from what our ancestors went through. And so you come in this space and you see these images yet again bringing up more traumatic experiences. Um, I think also uh, we kind of, for, not forget, but um, we're, we're talking about power and where power comes from. And when I think about power, I think about money and who has it. And that often the people with that money drive the yeses, right? So when we're talking about who's going to come see a show or not see a show, who's going to support it or not give money to support it, it's like, well, who has the pockets to make X happen? And I think about um, when I was at another institution and they were considering bringing a show of um, all black artists. There was conversation about whether the museum would get support from the community, enough support to show that work. And it made me think, they don't think we have money and they don't think we don't have the power to get people here to support these artists. Which kind of makes me think in the same way that there was not enough perceived power when this work went up that the shit would hit the fan. And it clearly has. Um, and so this has been talked about time and time again when we um, perceived real whatever, how, how people feel, when injustices are done against us at the first place you can hit people is in their pockets. And you, uh, we can ask for this work to be taken down, but then there's still power structures at play. That 10 years from now, it might be a different curator, a different director, and the same thing might happen. So how are we going to disrupt these things from happening over and over again? I haven't been following hands. Where's the mic? So, back here and here. Two questions in the back. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous, but I just wanted to kind of address one of the elephants in the room, right? And so, this isn't to say that I disagree with any of the outrage or. Um, the, dis the disgust that we have with the art. But I wanna address something because it reminds me of um, something else. There may be people in this room that when they look at the work, they see King Magazine and they see the over-sexualization of the black woman. And then the artist, Kelly Walker, who just happens to throw toothpaste over it, right? But what would you say to the person who's thinking when they look at that work, well, this is King Magazine, and they put a woman on the front of the magazine who's over-sexualized, one of my favorite artists, Khalees, and um, what would you say to that? Because it reminds me of how when the police kill black people, certain people in the community, community rise up and say, well, what about black on black crime? So when I look at that, it reminds me of what people would say. And when they see right behind that toothpaste, it, you know, is a magazine that put a black woman on the front of it, you know, with tiny shorts and she's over-sexualized. Uh, over so what would you say to that person? Because I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of people thinking that this is also a black thing, right? I got it, I got it. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So, uh, Wendy, hey, hey girl, what's up, hey. Um, so what I would say to that question, that's a real ass question because that did happen to me here in this museum during the artist talk, well after the artist talk by uh, Jean Crutchfield and Robert Hobbs, um, who actually is what? The, uh, the uh, African, uh, yeah, it doesn't even, doesn't even matter, but yeah, so they definitely asked me those questions and told me that, hey, um, 
this is this is a black magazine. Like, how do you how are you saying that this is an issue when you do you're doing this like to your own people? And I was like, this is not an issue of black on black crime, if that's what you're referring to. And that's like really 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 messed up because, as I stated before, they have management. They get paid for these things. Like, did Trina did Trina get paid for this? Do, are you gonna tell Trina about this? Like, did you tell Trina about? Like, does she know that she's like? You tweeted her? Okay. Like, and like, that's, that's, and you haven't gotten a response. And that's like, that's the thing. It's like, that doesn't matter. Like what you're saying, like not you, what, what they were saying to me, that doesn't matter to me because this is how I feel. Like, <laughs> black on black crime is just crime. This, this, this isn't just art though. And that's the difference. It's like, you can't just say, well, you're doing this, because we're not just doing this. You, he did this. Not we, he. He did this. And that's what I said to them. Because that's the issue. It's like, you're trying to put this accountability not on the right people. You're trying to take this accountability and put it back on us when we weren't the people that did this. Um, oh. I, Go ahead. I have an answer to that as well. I so, I mean, this is this. That's a it's a good question, right? It's <laughs> it's one that I've been thinking about, and I think actually, um, King existing is is micro, and men's magazines is macro, right? <laughs> so, um, and this is there are parts of this that sound fucked up, but. The larger issue is the existence of men's magazines in general, right? Like the sexualized space of women in general. Within that, <laughs> there's a lack of representation of black women, right? So for me, like King exists with all the problems that a men's magazine has, but it still exists as a space that reclaims some kind of uh, progress in terms of representation, in terms of a space where a, a curvaceous black woman can be featured and appreciated by the black male gaze that is mostly inundated with white women and arguably shapeless white women, right? So <laughs> I think... Arguably, that's another Arguably. conversation. Arguably. I mean, that's what I would say. So I, so, so I think the gestures that have been made, and again, I don't, wanna, I don't necessarily wanna talk too much about Kelly, but I think that for me, the, the gestures that have been made in that work, like undermine that power. And I think, I mean, if we're gonna talk about undermining the power of, of black women, I mean, I, I, th I think we need to talk about just, I don't know, I think we need to talk about like just the larger issue in addition to that. I mean, it can't just exist there because we get this question and these confusions. I think, I don't know. It's a, it's a problem that that is a positive space, right? King, I mean. Well, one thing I was just going to say uh, after Kat said this, because um, for those of you that aren't familiar with her work, please go check it out. And one of the things that I see in her work, and I kind of see with this King Magazine, who's to say that Trina or Khalees or Maya or anybody else that's been on the cover of King Magazine or Sports Illustrated when they want to do their bikini issue once a year or you know, someone like Serena Williams and, or whoever, it's on the cover of an ESPN and they're naked, but you don't see their, um, their nudity. Who's to say they're not just secure in their sexuality? I know plenty of women that are just like, yeah, I, if I could walk around topless all day, I would. If you were at Afropunk this year, you saw it. And they were secure in their sexuality. So to say, well, this is an over-sexualization of the work, I see that with toothpaste smeared on her backside, like a back shot. But 
that doesn't mean that we as women are over-sexualized if we decide to wear short shorts or a cut-off shirt or something that's low. That doesn't give you the right to tell us how we should be feeling or how we're dressed and, um, and, and why we decided to wear what we decided to wear that day. I mean, you know, someone may have just gotten their legs shaved and they're like, I'm gonna show these legs off and the shorter shorts I can find because they're secure in their body and their image. So let's just get that straight first um, before we talk about, like she said, because it's a black magazine, so. I mean, we don't argue with Jet Beauty of the Month, right? Because that, that's a thing that has to, ha I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that has to exist for some reason. Like, that was created for a reason, right? For a purpose, and like, I mean, I don't know. King exists in, for that same reason, and, but, it, but there's a larger problem that created that, the need for that existence. Yeah, I mean, the larger problem is sexism. Uh, it is the control of, it's, it's, the, it's the control of, of media, more, largely by men. Uh, it's the continued commodification, objectification of not only women, but in particular black women. It's a part of a long history of showcasing black women for the, for the public gaze, for the white gaze, for the black male gaze. Yeah, I mean, it's, that, that's, that's, that's all there. That's all there. So the, I guess the question becomes, um, for us, although I was like, oh man, he used King Magazine? Because I, 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 you know, I, I don't check out King, but, um, but I don't want to be on the whole, you know, black, bougie, responsibility tip where I'm like, yo, this shouldn't even exist. I mean, it, because it existed, now they could do this with the image and that with the image, but they're gonna do whatever they wanna do with the image anyways, right? So I, I, guess, I guess ultimately, I don't really, I, you know, personally I appreciate, you know, the question and the point of view. Um, the criticism, however, is a deeper one that I think speaks to our continued investment in uh, subjugating women and in particular subjugating and enjoying the the objective not the objective the, the the objectification of black women i mean it's just this is entertainment and so so not only because if you think about someone like trina or or Khalees, uh they have to look that way in an industry that makes women look that way so they can sell records. If there was a Queen magazine, what well, we have seen Biggie Smalls on the cover <laughs> like that. I mean, we saw Tupac, I mean, and we've seen, you know, 50 Cent, I mean, we've seen these black men looking this way or whatever, and we know what it's about. It's about selling magazines, but would it have been Biggie? Because Biggie is regarded as one of the, the top MCs of all time. Trina, even in this thing called you know, female MCs, FEMCs, I don't know if she was ever regarded as one of the top female MCs of all time, you know? What was, I, me, she, at the back, yeah, yo, yo, I feel you, I feel you, I feel you. So anyway, so I, I think for me, this is strictly about, you know, you, know you, you get somebody to take off their clothes just so that you can sell some magazines and somebody say, you know what, this would be, fun to place some art stuff on top of it and then, uh, and then I can further commodify the image of a black woman's body, so. Can, can brother man Ron over here get the mic? But there was a hand, I'm sorry, there was a hand before that she's had it up since the beginning so I don't wanna miss her. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. Do-gooder females would come in like a close, like not a close second, but it just wasn't. Can you possible. use the mic? Yes, I'm please? sorry. And um, and she didn't have a solution to that. And I'm observing this in the way I've been able to process this is is this analogy of a, bu a bubble that that nobody thought could burst. And I think what happened with this conversation that started is somebody finally burst it and called out the artist and the curator. And without answers and without explanations, I, I'm thankful this conversation has happened. And I'm envisioning like a Venn diagram of 
this elitist, financially driven bubble of the art world that some people aspire to be part of and, and for whatever reason, but that this bubble here, that this conversation that, that we're so lucky enough to come together to have kind of encroaches on that and crosses it and kind of like becomes one because I'm tired of it just as a female artist, the, you know, the roles that are given to that genre. So I don't, I wish that that professor had offered a solution and, um, and but there's action so we can all just speak with that, so thank you. You know, Jenna, I, uh, there's nothing wrong with the finance. Like you know, the finance needs to be there. It's how people, the gatekeepers of the art world, one of my best friends just told me, she just sent me an email, this lady does workshops on how to interact with the gatekeepers of the art world. <laughs> and I said, you know what, you know what, they're not really that, they're gatekeepers, but they're only gatekeepers in their mind because they get to, they, they choose. So they can choose what to tell the board. They can choose what to tell so-and-so. So they, they, you know, the money, the money is inanimate. The economy don't eat, breathe, and, you know, re reproduce. It, it, we have to move it. What's the problem is people's choices. People need to start making real choices, critical choices that are not at the expense of black community, especially here in St. Louis, right here, right now. Okay. Um, I did not come to the exhibition. I didn't make it to the um, artist talk. I knew about the exhibition. And Monday, I'm in class, and I get this phone call from my daughter, who's in Chicago. And she asked me, uh, point blank, she said, Ron, what's happening in St. Louis? What's happening with this exhibition? And I said, I'll get back with you. So I started talking to some people in my class that I knew had attended the exhibition. Somewhere in that conversation, there was a video tape of the, uh, of the artist talk Saturday. Well, apparently, it was taken down. My question is, why was that video taken down? Because evidently, if the museum's purpose was to create controversy, they achieved it because they got an auditorium full of people. So if that was your goal, to create controversy, why did the museum, where is the video if it exists, and why did the museum take it down? Well, I can. We had permission to stream the video live. We had this, uh, to, to stream the talk live. We did not have permission from the artist to be able to keep it up after its live stream. And therefore, we do not have the legal right to keep that up. That was not um, a decision to take it down because of it. In fact, I think there are many people who feel that the transparency of that video would actually be helpful for the people who were not here and did not experience it. But that was a, a, a what would you call it, a, a copyright issue, a, a, a license issue. If in fact somebody, um, excuse me, if in fact someone else outside of the museum had uh, recorded it and post, reposted online, would there be any uh, legal issues for the museum in regards to, or you all have you all have you all's legal um, I actually been meant? I mean, in all transparency and honesty, I don't I don't know how to answer that. I don't know. Um, I yeah. I mean, I could certainly find out legally, but I, I do not know that. I'm going to take the mic back. Thank you, Lisa. This is a, a, a panel discussion up here on the stage. We don't want to bother her while she's sitting there in her seat. Uh, but I want to tell you, everybody here, I'm going to be honest with you. I remember when I was in sophomore year in high school, I went to Metro Academic and Classical High School right here down the street. I walked in these front doors for the first time. We walked in and we saw a Getty Saboni exhibition. I didn't know what to think. I was like, man, I'm in Contemporary Art Museum. Wow, wow, <laughs> this is great. My, my classmates were like, man, they better take this back. 
back out to the trash can because these carpets, this ain't art. I said, well, what if it is art? This museum serves a prominent place in this community. Art 314, open studios, teen museum studies. New art in the neighborhood. I was, I was so close to being new art in the neighborhood, but I actually got, I got, I got commandeered over the Craft Alliance. <laughs> and I was in Craft in the Future. Hey. I mean, I, always, I knew Twan since then too. So I, you know, I was like, hey Twan, nice to see you. Hey, I'm over here at Craft Alliance on, up the street. Yeah, but we have to still respect this space. I love this place. I come here all the time. I came here last, a couple Fridays ago just for lunch at the cafe because it was good. <laughs> Because it was tasty. Because I love being here. I'm going to be honest with you. When I, said, when I heard that Mark Bradford is coming to St. Louis, Missouri, I was like, damn, wow. They got Mark from L.A. Wow. Wow. I was like, man, this place is doing work. They got research assistants working 24-7 over there. They got to be. Because they can't get all this work from London and... Asia and then New York and Texas. You know, it's like <laughs> we we might want we want we want change. We don't want to alienate, we don't want to hate. We want to make change, positive growth and development. Yeah. This is a community, you know, this is communal learning. And we have to we have to accentuate that. We have to keep going on that. And if it means being critical and telling somebody, no, man, you was wrong. Take that back. They got to say, yeah, you know, I'm hurt. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I did this. You know, I'm, I'm hurt that you told me that, I, you know, I'll, I'll try my best. You know, but if that best isn't good enough, you got to talk, you got to go. You know, sorry, Joe. Joe Blow, you got to go. You know, and that's the way it works. But don't hate the space. Mm -hmm. Just hate the decisions. And let's work to change them. I just, oh, bef before, I'm sorry, the next question, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think Khalil brought up a, a point that I don't know if the rest of you would be interested in, but I would like to move to, in some respect, is, okay, so what do we do now? Um, we talked a lot about accountability. So now, how do we put measures of accountability in place? with the artists, with the institutions, with community. I think, to me, this is a great way that the community has held this place, the people in this place responsible for these decisions accountable. But what do we do moving forward from now on? Um, I, I would really like to go towards that um, because I think a lot of times people have problems with these types of panels and these discussions is because that's all we do is discuss. There is no action afterwards. And so I want to know some actions, um, some accountability and, and what we do within the institutions that we work or that we support to stop BS from happening. So can I just ask, as my privilege as a moderator, what is it that you're suggesting? What is it that you would like to see? You, the or panel? Does the audience have a suggestion? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I, what do people can, can, what I, people can I, I can say now, like, the pieces that are offensive, they got to come down. That's it. Like, fuck, fuck all the rhetoric. Let's make this real easy. Not feeling them. Well, and that's a question I just asked my queen. I was like, I want to ask y'all, what, what the fuck do y'all think? We don't want to be talking all the time. We want to hear from the community at large. We'll yell out to us what you feel is active. Maybe, um, Maybe not yell. I was going <laughs> to. And can I ask? We don't want to turn up in here. <laughs> well, well, can I ask just a follow up question? And it's, it's not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, even though, I mean, Black people are often victims of conspiracies. But um, I think, you know, one of my concerns about um, taking work down when it's there, I always think that once we start saying, um, you know, and I'm in the academy, and there are lots of things been going on in the last few years of people not getting tenure, people getting fired because of speech. And one of the things we hold very deeply um, is the right to 
that, that people are going to do things that are offensive and that we have the right to do them and that they're culture spaces and academic spaces where we have to protect it. And I guess one of my concerns, um, particularly as someone who offends people often um, with things that I write or and have many friends who do so um, and think about the city and let's say that you're doing work that's pro-Palestine or you're doing work that is you know controversial in sort of lots of ways I my concern might be that the first people that are come for once the standard has been set to take something down are people like us so maybe that's not true but I just want to put that out as a question. Um, oh, can I speak? I was going to say, uh, in my opinion, and I'm just speaking for myself, I feel like black people are tastemakers when it comes to culture and cool shit anyway. So if like enough black people say that something's whack, it's probably usually whack. Um, so if you got like enough black people saying like, oh, I ain't really fucking with that, enough times if a lot of people say it over and over again, either if you're an artist, you, you could take a little bit of critique, but if, if, you, if you do something and people ain't feeling it, you stop doing it. But if, every, if nobody's telling you that it's not cool, you're gonna continue to keep making that same kind of art, regardless of how offensive it is, regardless of how much you can understand it. If it's whack, it's whack. Like, this shit on this wall over here is whack. So, like, you got whack shit hanging on your walls. Well, one of the things I wanted to say is, um I mean, sometimes, yes, we are going to be offended by the things that we see, uh, whether they're in our own, um, our own jobs or in art institutions. And had we not all come together, this wouldn't have happened in the first place or even before the exhibition was even put up. I mean, I've attended uh, an exhibition here in the city maybe six months ago, maybe more than that. And probably half the people on this panel were at the same exhibition. And I was like, you know what? If you guys are really upset like I am, write a letter. And I did. And nothing happened, because I stood by myself. I'm not faulting my friends for not writing a letter. Life gets in the way. They also had a talk. But I thought that things just weren't kosher. And I don't need to bring up the gallery. I don't need to bring up what the artwork was. But it's just like, you have to hold somebody accountable. You have to speak. You have to say something. So. Even though the work in that particular gallery was never taken down, I, was, I did receive a response, several responses, as we emailed back and forth about things, but I never really received a proper answer about certain things. I'm glad that in this case we've come together, and should it be the decision of the museum and their staff and the directors to take the artwork down, then it shows that there is power in numbers, and it doesn't have to just be the black community that's upset about it. If you're a white or Asian or Hispanic or other, I feel like all the boxes are being checked, but it's just like whatever it, it, your race is and you just feel offended by it or you see where we're coming from, then yes, stand with us in, this, um, in our plea to have something like that removed. I'm not saying that someone has to like lose their job over it, but I'm saying maybe something needs to change with the work. Because when it comes to privilege and it comes to these things, you, you have blinders on and maybe you don't necessarily see through the same lens that we see through. So, And here's, here's another point. When is apology not enough? Okay? You know, we can go out and the kid gets shot in the police and they say, oh, we're sorry, here's, here's money to the family. Is that, is, is that going to bring back the life that was lost? Is that enough? Just saying, hey, I'm sorry, that's cool. If that's the case, let me come break in your house and steal your shit, and then you catch me and I say, oh, I'm sorry. That's just not enough. There needs to be some action. Some restitution. Exactly. An and an acknowledgement. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna say something real quick. Um, so I have a double major, in my bachelor's I got a double major in art history and ceramics. Um, and we have to forget, or not forget, but we always have to remember too, like when we think about art and art history, that's still a part of, a, of, of history. Mm -hmm. That's still a part of what we all do communally as people. So if these images talk about a problematic issue, and you, like, just think of a common sense. You spill chocolate sauce on your counter, you gotta scrape it up and clean it up, and you gotta get it off your counter because you want your counter to be clean, you know, pristine, ready for you to cook some food for your family. 
You come in in a gallery and you see an image of people who look like you or not look like you, but you might have some relationship to because it's still your history. Mm -hmm. That's still problematic. I want to read you a little something real quick. I wrote it. And it's about the work, so it's not really that funny. I said, if you support this work, you support white supremacy. A white man being able to do whatever they want without question. Without question, that's a problem. I was in my class this afternoon with my professor, Jessica Barron, director of Fort Gondo Compound for the Arts back in the back. And, and, she, and she said censorship. And, and she said censorship, you know. This, it's, it's censorship if you take it down. I said, yes, it's, 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 it's censorship. It's, I said it's not censorship if you take it down because if you don't believe in it, you don't support it, then you take it down because you don't believe in it and you don't support it. She said, well, no, Khalil, that's actually still censorship. And, but then she said something great. She came back and she hit me with some knowledge and she told me if it deals with hate and if it deals with something inappropriate in the bylaws in between all that censorship stuff, there is some, some clause about hate. That's continuousness, that's a continual representation of hate towards black people. Yes. Keeping it up yes. says that you, if you support this work, you support white supremacy and a white man being able to do whatever he wants without question. Without question. Without question. <laughs> and we're questioning it right now. And just to add on to that, also saying that I made this work and now you deal with it. Okay, like I ask a question and you can't defend it because now I have to deal with it. Um, and then also kind of going back to what Danny was saying, um, if you consider yourself to be an ally of a person of color or anyone and they're your friend they're your lover, they're your buddy, and you don't stand with that person when they're saying this. Instead, after the fact, you go up to them and say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for saying that. Oh my gosh, I really needed for someone to say that. Next time, and Damon said this, he's like, next time you say it. Next time you stand up, because I'm out here looking crazy. My career's on the line, all of these things. And next time, you stand and you say something if you feel that way. If you feel that this is an issue, say it. That's, it's about acknowledgement, once again. Any other questions? So, I'm a student at Webster, and so um, they had a field trip um, when the ex when, on the first day of the exhibition, and I didn't go um, because I was working on research and I was just overwhelmed by it, so I didn't go. But um, I saw all of the stuff on Facebook, all the critiques coming out, and just um, I, it really resonated with me as a black person. And so, um, just sitting here at the panel, I'm listening to folks um, talk about um, what this institution means to them and how it's been a space for them. And I say, um, as a native of St. Louis, city and the county, um, spaces like this, I've never felt welcomed in. You know, um, we talk, y'all talked about a lot of times um, black youth growing up and internalizing and being inundated with anti-black images. Um, I was one of those kids, right? And so I walked around the city with the weight of my abject place in society um, all day, every day. And so I never felt that, I never felt uh, uh, represented here. I never felt safe here. I never felt safe in a lot of institutions, to be uh, quite honest. Um, so I guess um, I'm a, I, I plan to be a future educator. Um, I plan to work with youth um, to build a, a more critical, uh, a media literate black youth here in the city. Um, and so, I'm glad to be here to be in community with you all, but I guess my question is about how do we free the black body, um, right? Because um, when we talk about the continuities of uh, uh, colonialism, anti-blackness, shadow slavery, so as artists, as community folk, 
um, right? How do we free the black body? How does our art, how does our, um, our, our what is it, what is our everyday praxis around abolition look like in terms of freeing the black body? Um, I came in here and I saw the, the, um, the King magazine, I saw it. I wanted to take it, I wanted to take it down myself when I looked at it, right? But I can't, right? Because of censorship, because of the, the walls that are, that are built up. So what recourse do we have to free the black body? Um, these interlocking systems, these interlocking institutions of oppression, how do we free the black body? Um, sorry. Um, so for your first part of not feeling comfortable places, um, definitely can relate to that, of course, um, <clears throat> right? And I think that a lot of um, black people can relate to that, um, or even socioeconomically, like not being able to relate to that, and that also goes to the leaders, like, you know, all of that. Um, but what I wanna go back to is what I heard in um, Mark Bradford's talk. I listened to that, like I watched it on YouTube because I wasn't here, like I was in Berlin. So it's like, that's how important it was for me to listen to this man speak about this. Um, and how bringing, like everybody thinks that it's about coming here, but what about going there? Like how, like, and that's also what we're talking about is coming into the community. Like this is about lack of awareness of the community that this building is in. Like bringing this work here when we're all like, this is a, yeah, like what the fuck? And also like this is, it's a fresh, this is still a wound that's very open and has been open and it hasn't been just for three years. This has been for a very long time. Exactly, and it's been for a very long time. Like the divide of St. Louis, like this right now, like everybody is here and listening and that is absolutely astonishing for me to see that. But as far as freeing the black body, um, that is something that I definitely question myself with the work that I make. And, um, but seeing Carrie, Carrie James Marshall, okay, seeing Carrie James Marshall's work in Chicago at the MCA, talking about normalcy and how important that is for us to see like black children just going camping. That's important to see. And that's also an exercise of, I guess, freeing the black body of like, it, can't, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a hundred. You don't have to always be depicted in a certain type of way. Um, so I think that really seeing that and how normal, because I'm normal, like, I mean, I, I'm, to an extent, whatever. <laughs> I'm wearing a white wig right now, but whatever. Um, but I'm 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 normal. I'm not like this thing. I'm not like I'm not I'm not like that. Like I'm me. I'm cat. I'm cat, and I'm black, and that's all that I do know, and that is normal for me. Um, I didn't I didn't really answer it, but there's. Can I? Can I? Oh. Um, I'm going to speak to you, brother, directly. Uh, you talk about freeing the black body, and I think it's us being comfortable in our own skin first. You know, not allowing people to validate who we are. You know, I went to UMSL and I was definitely the only black class in the design class and I was not welcome. Um, I couldn't even get critiques. And I didn't see anyone that looked like me. No one would talk to me. And it took me to just say, you know, I told my mom, I was like, I can't do this. And she's like, well, you're gonna quit, quit. Just like that. I don't know, it felt harsh at the time, but I think she knew there was something about me that wouldn't quit. And I look, start doing research, I start looking at design books, and I taught myself, right? And I was secure in that. And maybe freeing the black body is freeing the mind first. I, I, I wanna answer his question as well, because I mean, as an educator, and as an educator here, and, and then also like, um, to, like to address the question or, or the comment about not feeling welcome in these spaces and, and, and never thinking of a, this as, as a space for you. Um, again, that's a, a much larger problem, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem that, that no one thinks of this space as somewhere that they can go in. And, and, I've, and I've witnessed that, you know, I've witnessed seeing it, like, you know, being outside of an art gallery and seeing you know, having a group of, of young, like black teenagers, like walk past looking inside and like wondering whether or not they should go in. And it was like, you know, I was like, go in, like go see it, go check it out, see what it's about. Um, but I think what that comes from again is like, is that is that lack of representation, right? If you don't know anyone who's an artist, like why are you gonna think about an art museum? And 
you know, at the risk of sounding like like some like cosmopolitan, you know, bragger up here with Khalil talking about travel, um, I went. <laughs> I went. <laughs> I worked hard for that. I know. I know. We're hard for that. I, know, we know, we know. I I I went to. I went to, to Rome for the first time last year, and what I was struck most by was not, not the ruins, and what I was struck by, well, the, the gelato, but what I was struck by the most was, um, was the wealth of, of representation of Romans in sculptural form. The wealth of material that represented an identity and I was and on this like incredibly massive scale. And it's like, we don't have anything like that here in a diverse way, right? So it's like, it's only commemorative or memorialized, but it's not just like regular ass sculpture, <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that, that people in any community can identify with. And, and they got me thinking like, what must it feel like to grow up like seeing a kind of like creative and material formal product out in the world as like as being so regular right and i think i think blacks in this country are behind in that way and it's not it's you know with without even knowing it you know what i mean and, and it's it's super it's a super it's like an incredible disadvantage to not understand that that is a way that is a way to be it, it, it is a way to that 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 is that that um, that process or that ownership or that agency to make things and have them exist as a trace of your pr productivity, like to not even be able to think about that, for that to not even enter your mind, like, like that's something that requires a lot of work of us, right? So I think a way to change your, your, your concept of where you are welcome is to, I mean, come to these spaces for one, but like make, make so much fucking art, right? And like, I mean, if, if, it, if it's about art, it's about so much more than art. Art ain't even about art, right? Um, <laughs> make art and tell everybody you know to make art. Like, so, so we're coming, we have about 15 minutes or so left and there are a few hands up and so I was hoping I could take a few questions in a row. And then, um, so here, Jason, then there was Adrian in the back someone right there and then there was a hand I wanted to catch so let's just try to sort of go in a circle and uh, see I'm, I'm, the in next a, I'm in a tandem my, my wife is here also she's, she's gonna say something also with, with me but my name, my name is Jason Wilson and um, <clears throat> sorry hold on. my name is Jason Wilson and, and uh, I'm an African-American <laughs> who's on the board of CAM right and I know that everybody here feels a certain way about the art. And Jeffrey and I um, talked about the art weeks before um, you know, it was going up. And I pushed for that piece to go up. I pushed for it. I'm going to stand by it. Let me tell you why. Because right now, these beautiful people right here, and you all are as beautiful as well, are here talking about something that you would never talk about, ever. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to agree, I'm not looking for any applause. But every day I'm faced with the same thing. I'm in the coffee industry. I'm the only Negro in the coffee industry. <laughs> let, me, let me be real about that. I own Northwest Coffee, and I'm the only brother in the coffee industry, period. And I roast coffee, and none of you, half of you all, don't even know about it. Three-fourths of you all don't even know that. And I got to keep it low, and I can't talk about being black. And it's the same thing. And in that room with Lisa and Jeffrey and the rest of the team, it's rough. It's rough making decisions. You all want to take it down. You think it's a quick decision. It's just not. 
It's rough. And it's rough being the only African American in the room talking and listening and being careful and dancing, dancing the jig. Come on. It's not cool. But guess what? Every day I'm going to get up, I'm going to push forward, I'm going to do it. You hear how I sound? I sound really regular. So don't, I don't want you to, I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying here. I feel what they feel, because I'm African American too. But I also feel like this dialogue has to happen in everybody now since Michael Brown got shot. I mean, even before that, let's go back a little bit. But even before that, Chanti, hold on. Even before that, um, I mean, everybody's more aware now. Everybody's smarter now. They've read more. You know, they know, they know more about all the, uh, the history that's taken place with blacks in America. And so, so this happened. And now this is happening and we're having this conversation because everybody's more aware now. I don't think it should come down. You gotta have more dialogue. I, I applaud Damon for, for uh, uh, voicing his opinion and getting you all here tonight. I applaud Jeffrey and Lisa and everybody else for making the decision to put it up. And I applaud these folks up here for expressing their opinion. Because, man, shit, I want to cry too. It's serious. I don't have much more to say about this. I mean, it's more of a diatribe than anything else, but I just want to make sure you all understand that these decisions are not hard. I mean, they're not easy. They're difficult. Sitting in rooms like these are difficult. There is a money play. It's always difficult. It's not simple. Pull it down. It's not simple. So I'm not looking for any applause. I just want you all to understand who I am as one of the brothers in the room that's dealing with the situation. And, I, and trust me, man. Just like, just like my man said, um, uh, if you're black, or if, you're, if you're white, you probably got a black friend. So it's, you should feel this, you should feel the pain. Well, I mean, it goes both ways in the situation. It's a tough situation. It's not easy. So thank you all. And we're gonna take a few questions in a row and then have final comments oh. from the panel. So. Uh and mm -hmm. so I just had two things to say. I'll make it quick. If I talk longer than two minutes, sh feel free to shut me up. So I'm Jason's wife, so he and I have talked about this a lot. We have very different opinions of this. And I'm also going to reframe some of what was said about the idea of censorship. To me, we are not telling artists that they can't express themselves or we're not telling people they can't say what they can say. It is about deliberate decisions about what we choose to put in institutions. So like Rebecca, I'm an academic. I respect freedom of speech, but I also think a press has the ability to say they don't want to put my work in there. So those are two different things. People can express themselves. I also think it's not offending people. I think it's about a deep hurt that's happening that I hear. And I'm not an art expert. I looked at it and I thought, I, I was neither offended nor moved. I just thought, okay, I. I'm not an artist, so I don't understand what made it art. But I did think, <laughs> when I start to hear experts, meaning artists, evaluate things, I respect that. And when I see artists who come from a community who is being represented, who feel a deep hurt. Again, this isn't about offense. It's about a hurt in a post-Ferguson era where our community is suffering. I don't mean just our black community as a black woman who has a black husband and two black sons. I mean racially. People who came out tonight, whether you're black, white, Latino, Asian, you're out because you care about the race of our community. I don't know where I stand on it, but I don't think taking it down is gonna stop the conversation. I think it's going to, I think it could potentially make a bold statement that we can do something and then say, you know what? this was hurting our community. I'm from DC, and I think if Native Americans want to, ch and I'm a huge Redskins fan, I think if Native, if Native Americans think that's offensive and thinks for it's time for us to stop using that name as a Redskins fan, I don't mind calling it the, I don't know, whatever team. So I think to move on, we sometimes do need to say, does the expression 
and does the sentiment in the community that we've generated match our intended goal? And if there is a divide between our goal of something that we do and the way it's received, I think we sometimes need to take a, take a step back and say, I'm going to take a bolder stand and do something about it. So thank you very much, panelists, for coming out. And to my colleague in the struggle, Rebecca Alonzo, thank you for, for doing the panel. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Steve Henry and I'm actually uh, the director of Paula Cooper Gallery and we represent Kelly and uh, I've been, I said I, I'm, I'm, my name is Steve Henry, I'm director of Paula Cooper Gallery, we, re we represent Kelly in New York and I've been working with him, you know, since we took him on, actually I brought him to the gallery and, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking to hear this because I know that, you know, knowing his work intimately, um, you know, his intentions obviously are not, they're not based, they're not racist. I think that, you know, in fact, I was at the talk on, on Saturday and when he was talking about the Black Star Press, I thought, oh, he's actually being very articulate about it and talking about his, his interest in it as political, as talking about issues of race, the male gaze. Um, and then, of course, at the end, when he did shut down, and he did, he shut down. He would not engage, he wouldn't answer questions. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it gave us all great pause. I mean, it, it hurt. And, and I think that one of the things that I think we all regret is that, you know, Kelly did fail in addressing issues and, and, and concerns and hurt here. I think we as supporters of Kelly failed in preparing him for that. Um, you know, I think that the world in which, you know, coming from New York and coming from an insular art world, we don't, I think we were a bit naive about what happens here and what this city is. And it's, it's you know, the, the, the sort of rends in the community here are, are, are as extreme as I've ever seen. And, and Obviously, people are trying to, to, to address that, but I think part of it was, was you know, part of the problem with, with the perception of the show, and, and particularly these works, is that you know, he, he and we should have gone and given more context to it. So, I, you know, it's backtracking. I think this is incredible, what you're doing, and I'm glad that I came for this. So. Um, I really want to thank every single one of you on the panel, those of you who I know and those of you who I just met tonight because your collective, your individual and your collective comments have been so powerful and so poignant. I'm still s kind of a newcomer to St. Louis even though I've been here for nine years, but um, I mean, this stuff goes back, as you all are pointing out, a long time. I, I, wanna, I wanna pick up on something that a number of you talked about, which is that a lot of this is about the power of these institutions and the power structures of these institutions. Not just the power of the institutions, but the power structures of the institutions. Um, I am deeply struck by the fact that, um, and I don't know if this is very different in New York City, but I'm very struck by the fact that in St. Louis, in our mainstream museums, I think we only have one African-American curator um, I think only one, and we have incredible teams of African American educators who I think we'll all learn tonight were not adequately empowered to help us grapple with this work in ways that could have been productive and, and useful. Um, I'm, you know, we talk a lot about the collecting practices, we talk about the gallery practices, we talk about the, the production, the consumption, the marketing of art. Lyndon, you talked about the fiscal, the fiscal aspects. So, I want us to really think about how we can use this moment to think about the power infrastructures of our arts institutions in St. Louis. Are there things that we can concretely call for? Can we, can we ask donors, I don't know if there are any of my wealthy friends in this room, um, but I don't know if we can ask donors to help us change the pipeline in meaningful ways. Can we, can we create additional fellowships to have 
African American curators? Can we try to create additional positions so we can have more arts educators? Um, so I would love to hear the panel. You will have me thinking about this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and thoughts from other people about how we can use this moment to fundamentally transform. I mean, and I'll be honest, to me it's not about taking this art down. To me it's about long-term transformation of our arts institutions in this city. So that's what I'd like to see and look to see us talk about. And if we could just, just even for like, 45 seconds, so this man right here and this woman right here has had her hand up for a, in the white shirt. You've had your hand up for a long time. So just him and then she'll have the final comment before our panelists. It's the rain. Okay. Oh, Sorry about that. Um, may I apologize for Kelly Walker myself as in I think it's just a travesty that he himself is not here to apologize and that he's here to have his gallery do it for him. I think that that alone is a uh, you know, disrespect to you in general. Um, I would, my question I was gonna ask is if you think there's any way that his work could be validated had he had a response to you when you asked those questions, because I, you know, unbeknownst about his spe speech, I came here yesterday uh, to write about the work and I, I immediately also was like, man, this is gonna be a problem. But I, you know, I figured since it's in this space, it has to have some kind of relev relevancy and um, gravity into it that uh, would make, would validate the work. And I thought to myself, well, I, you know, I try to explore it. And I thought, when I looked at uh, Black Star Press, um, I thought about the, uh, the black individual and th the way that, I guess I, I thought his uh, intention was how tragedy has been transformed into the spectacle, you know, and especially by the media and is consumed by them almost perversely to the point that they want, you know, another, another one of these tragedies to happen. And the repetition was kind of, um, it was emblematic of that. And I wanted to think if you had thought to think about that in any sort of way, especially in the red where, um, the red and white, you know, where it highlighted that Coca-Cola uh, branding, if you thought about it in that light, or, you know, if there's any way that you thought this work is validated or if it's just, there's no way that this work could have been created by a white individual and have this, you know, any kind of salience. Thanks. And a final comment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Frida Wheaton, and I'm director and curator at Vaughn Cultural Center, and I also have a private art gallery and consulting practice. My question, which some of you alluded to this point during your introductory comments, um, I don't know, if, quite frankly, if it's so much for you, but to the apologists for the artists, because I'd like to know, what do you think about first and second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth and eleventh and twelfth graders coming to see this? And I should say before we go into the panelists, um, there is an apology um, from Walker that um, that people can that can be read. Um, I was told that, and there was a question about whether or not he should be here. And there are some of us talked about it and decided that it we wanted to center black voices. Um, but so, which was a decision. You know, who's in the room? There were a bunch of people who were in the room who decided we didn't particularly want to hear from him at this tonight, but, so I just want to let you know that is, that was discussed. Are we going down the line? Yeah. Let's go down the line. <laughs> so I, I was, I was driving here and uh, got out of my car and I noticed that uh, a white friend of mine sent me a text. He says, we no longer have a reason to talk. And I was wondering, wow, white friend, where did this come from? <laughs> I mean, we were just talking the other day. You were telling me about all these things and all of this stuff. So where did this come from, white friend? I know that my white friend 
because I still call him a white friend, uh, is on Facebook a lot. And he sometimes comments on things that I'm tagged in because he doesn't have that many friends. And so the th on Facebook. <laughs> and so what happens is that you see that and he's like, wow, you know, I can't believe you're going to be on this panel that's going to, you know, talk about this art and it deals, deals with race. Now, I don't know if it matters, but my white friend also is like a Republican. But again, I don't know if that matters. I really don't know. Because I mean, Republicanism in, in an urban area can be a little more, you know, I don't know, whatever. Bottom line though, I was really struck by this. So I called my white friend as I walked to the building. I said, white, I said hello, white friend. I don't know what prompted the, uh, you saying that you don't want to be my friend anymore, like we have no other reason to talk, uh, but please give me a call, because I want to know exactly what your reason is so I could better understand the nature of how you see the world, white friend. And the funny thing about it is that he never responded. And, and I, 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 the thing is about people who create, sometimes there's a, a privilege in not having to address your audience, right? Not ever having to address, you don't even think about addressing your audience. You never, no one ever asked you or took you to task for it before. And perhaps because we live in this world, in this present time, where there are black men who, black men and black women who are being murdered uh, by the state or by representatives of the state, we have a, a revolutionary mm, uh, energy in the air, and we want to be critical and call things to people's attention. That art that was created in a, a, a so recently a post 9-11 world, like in 2005, 2006, it's probably gonna get a different kind of reception in 2016, especially when last night we saw riots and we saw protests in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's gonna have a different context. And that's the thing about art. Art is, exists within context. And the artist should always be able to at least speak to some degree about the context because the truth of the matter is it comes out of a space. This person made this art for some reason. What was he responding to? What was the context of his creation? What was he thinking about? These are really interesting points. And so I would love to see a, a, a blog you know, posts, I love, not, a, not a, an apology, just a statement. Let us know where, does is, is it exist? It exists. So yeah, and maybe post that on the website so that we can also see the statement, you know? And so anyways, with that said, you know, I, I really do, good deal, so, perfect. Because artists should have to be able to address the audiences, and, and really, tonight is about us holding somebody accountable for some work that he created in a world that was different from now, right? And so anyways, uh, thank you for including me in this conversation, and I, and I really appreciate all the comments from the panelists, the deeply felt comments from the panelists, as well as uh, from the audience. I think this is where we are today. If you're gonna talk about some shit, if you're gonna create some art, you be able to defend it. Because where I come from, if you can't defend what you create, then stop creating. Uh, I'm gonna go down, I guess, the line. So I, I will reiterate the question of, of Jonathan. The question of Kelly being here, that, that was brought up. And um, just in, in kind of, I was gonna say taking the temperature, but feeling the temperature in the city, <laughs> it didn't seem like his presence would be welcome. Um, so we opted against that. And we felt that this conversation wouldn't have happened with Kelly in the room. Um, how would it be different if he was able to articulate his thoughts behind the work? I think, I think it would have been incredibly different, right? I think that um, I think that this, I mean, yeah, you know, it, it's unfortunate that all of this rides on, you know, not just one artist or one work of art or one exhibition in a stream of many exhibitions, but like one, one failed performance, you know, in, in relationship to that exhibition and to that work. And um, I think, um, you know, I still believe that had he shown up, in a genuine way, I think it would have been very different. I think, I, think, I think there would have been probably even more depth to this conversation based on um, 
I don't know, based on just, you know, uh, I don't know, a more sort of genuine and present response to, you know, the work that's in that next room. Um, and as far as like what to say, or, you know, about K through 12 being in this room or in, you know, in these spaces seeing this work, um, you know, normally, again, my position here would be to take them around these exhibitions and, and tell them about it. Um, but I don't feel, again, equipped or, or um, convinced to do that in a, in a constructive way. So um, I won't be. So I want to uh, comment on, uh, Lyndon said much of what I had to say about some other topics. So I'm going to talk uh, to Adrian's point about institutional change like how how do we go about this so if some of you know about the bearden fellowship at the st louis art museum you might also know about similar fellowships and i was a bearden fellow at slam i see another current bearden fellow out there there are other fellowships like this around the country and they're currently being challenged as uh if they're if it's discrimination in the other way uh like reverse racism right <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I, I'm really not capable of oppressing someone else, but that's besides the point right now. Um, I, when I think about long-term institutional change, and if I you know, go through a fellowship and I go get my PhD in art history, I then still, with my other brothers and sisters who might have done a similar program, still have to go in these same institutions that have been run by a very similar brand of people who have a similar brand of education. And so to me, when I think about institutional change, it's not just getting more folks like us to get PhDs, to get art histories, to basically infiltrate these, institu these institutions. I think more about how can we differently educate all of our children in this country so that we have a better understanding of what has happened in this country, what has happened in this world, and how it affects all the different bodies and psyches here. Because once you start to affect change at a younger level or at a, a younger age, you grow up with a different way of being and thinking and interacting in society. So we have to start affecting change at a much younger age um, in our school districts, in our homes, when we're out with grandpa or grandma at the cafe, when we're with crazy auntie or uncle who's talking about all sorts of stuff, it, it comes down to like basic one-on-one -on -one interactions. How can we start changing how we talk to our neighbors or our, our friends at work and say, you know what, that comment you said was pretty ignorant. And I, let's, let's talk about how and why that's ignorant. That needs to start happening. It can't just happen in the institutions when the world outside of the institution is still the same. Um, and then, yeah, uh, yes, that is all I have to say, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna take one last long look around this whole room so I can see just about almost everybody's eyes that I can before I say what I have to say because it's about to be crucial. <laughs> so um, first I'll talk about your comments. Change still can occur when radical change happens. You can still talk about the presence of work without it being present in your space. You can still make change when you acknowledge history. History already exists. Black people are getting killed today. You can talk about, let's change the institution, you know, because these people are, you know, like this is affecting all of us. You don't need a, I don't need a painting to educate me. I don't need something to stand as, a, as an object to, to kind of recall that because that's already in my flesh and blood. It's already in all of our flesh and blood. One thing, I got a piece of news. My grandmother told me when I was younger, what starts at home spreads abroad. So if this is your home, then you best don't get to start working so it can spread abroad. If you, don't, if you have work like this, like I said before, you support white supremacy and you let a white man do what he wants to do without question. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a reality. 
Now we'll get to some more questions. Um, can there be legitimacy for Kelly's work? Uh, and your question, John, you said, if it is emblematic of, or you said what you said, and I said, if it is emblematic of this history, why would you want to keep seeing it over and over and over? With chocolate sauce. Chocolate sauce doesn't, does, ch I put chocolate sauce in my white milk so I can, so I can have chocolate milk. I don't put chocolate sauce on my body so a dog can come and bite me. And be okay with it. There's, I don't, I don't lather my woman up with toothpaste before I, you know, try to go hang out. You know, tooth. To me, I'm gonna talk to my, I'm gonna talk about my, my buddy right here, Jeffrey. When we were in class last year, he said material has meaning. That image is flattened. So no matter what, whatever Kelly says about the, the layer of the toothpaste and the image being separate, when it gets printed, it's flattened and that toothpaste is on her body, so that digital reprint of her body still has meaning. I'm sorry. No, no, we can't do that, I'm sorry. It's, um, and, and Adrian, Andrew Mellon Foundation is working on it. When I was in Kansas City, the Andrew Mellon Foundation provided hundreds of thousands of dollars in a trust. So young artists, historians, can participate in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the LA County Museum of Art, the Dallas-Fort Worth Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago. So there's like two or three fellows a year with, well, let's do it. Let's call the Andrew Mellon Foundation and ask for that money so Cam can have some of those representatives right here. I was actually one of the first applicants for that program, but you know what they told me? Oh shit, you're graduating too soon. I can't give you the money, but you, you're the best candidate. And I said, you know, I'm gonna keep going because I know I have your support. I told Catherine Footer, I love you. If you know who Catherine Footer is, tell her, tell her talk to her about me because I worked hard at the Nelson. Oh my God. <laughs> Hands up. <laughs> um, so back to the comment regarding as to um, why Kelly isn't present and if we would want him here. And I'm just going to say exactly what Lyndon said. Yes, we, no, we did not want him to be here because once again, that would not actually be a critical conversation. It would just be everybody talking to him about his work and that's not what we really want this to be. Um, and also, you don't get a second chance. Like, you don't get a second chance to come in here and write things. Like, no, this is, you make controversial work. Here's controversy for you to discuss, but not to discuss, because I guess you don't want to do that. But anyway, um, <laughs> talking to Ellie about content and how important that is, um, when I was trying to be like, oh, I make conceptual work, but I don't want it to be like content, blah, blah, blah. It still has meaning and it's still actually, lack of content is still content. And the fact that he couldn't explain the content is the issue. Um, and yes, we do appreciate that you are here to represent him. But at the same, no, no, at the same time though, it's just, I hope, I hope that he is watching this. And I hope that the work and the way that he feels is different. And that's all that I really want to say regarding it. Well, I'll just make this really quick. Um, one of the things I was just kind of, sorry I had to write this down or else I'd lose my thought, but to Frida's point, uh, as someone that's in education, administration, all that stuff, it is going to be hard to discuss this work to uh, children that are K through 12. And I understand what Jason is saying about there are politics to it. It's not easy to just say, take it down. You know, and we're all like, yes. And we all start ripping it from its sides and we're burning it and we're stomping on it. And we're like, to the man, you know, we can't do that. I get that. And we talked about censorship. So whether the work comes down or it doesn't come down, Maybe it's up to us as educators, as artists, as people here in the community, whether we just even want to talk about it anymore. Um, sometimes, I, I, like my godfather tells me, he's like, you know, when you're done like screaming from the rooftops and telling somebody something that you think they need to know, just flush the toilet on it. So that's all I can do in this situation. 
Um, I came, I saw, and then I left. <laughs> I'm still gonna support CAM that we've talked about earlier. Um, I'm not gonna sit up here and say, I'll never come back to CAM or do anything with the contemporary because of one L that they took for this particular uh, body of work. But uh, at the same time, you as artists and people of the community have to decide what you're gonna say about it or what you're not gonna say about it. Um, none of us have really been silent this evening. We've all given our opinions. But at the end of the day, if you do have to come through with children or your own child or a school group, maybe just avoid it altogether and be like, well, we're not gonna talk about this because it's too, much, it's too controversial. Or maybe you do explain why it's here and what the artist really didn't say about it. So, I mean, I know he has, um, there's been an apology. Like I said, I'm so tired of hearing apologies. I've heard them all my life and people don't, they're not really heartfelt. And I've heard Kelly talk twice. And even when he talks, it sounds like he doesn't really want to address anybody or answer any questions. So I'm very surprised. I don't even know what, if it sounds like it or if there's a smile across his face or if it's going to be genuine or heartfelt. So we'll see what this quote unquote apology is, but don't, don't hate the institution because they made the choices to put it here. Just choose not to maybe associate with the art if it has to stay up. I'll make this quick. Um, I honestly didn't want to say any last thoughts because I feel like every day I have to educate um, a lot of white folks that I interact with that ask me a lot of stupid ass questions. Um, the one thing that I do want to say is I want us as people of color to change the narrative and I'd like institutions to allow us to change the narrative and that's particularly important right now because you look on the news and they're always painting us as savages. If you look at history, we've been painted, we've been demonized. So I would like for institutions to allow us, paint us in a different light. It's something that kids can look up to because I'm not gonna show my daughter that piece ever. That's not propagating anything positive. But we, but, but, but we are painting a different picture here. We have been, all of us here definitely have been making a difference. We don't need to be allowed to. You just gonna need to start to accept that we're present. Because yes. it ain't gonna change. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was such an extraordinarily rich panel and I, I still, I, I'm left even though this was sort of a very hard week for a lot of people. Um, I think I'm left with a sense of optimism, actually, that there will be further conversations and some change. Um, so thank you so much, and let's give a hand to our really brilliant panel. Um.